everyone, I'm Pat and this is Frankie and we are Engine Power. Today we are going to be talking about Boost. Today we're going to talk about adding boost to an engine and we have done our fair share of that here on the show. Everything from inline sixes to big block Fords and everything in between. So we're going to talk about why you would do it, what you need to do it and how to do it on your own. But before we get into that, we need you to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to get notifications on when we put out something new. And we'd like you to comment below on anything you'd like to see in the future. Okay, first, what is Boost? Seems like a pretty basic question, but let's break it down. Boost is when we're using a mechanical means to force air into the engine and the engine itself becomes a restriction. It can't take in any more air and pressure builds up in the intake track. And that means that the air is more dense. If it's more dense, it has more oxygen. If it has more oxygen, we can apply more fuel with it. And if we can effectively burn it, we can make more power. So we're gonna do that with a mechanical means of some sort, whether it's old school or new school. Believe it or not, Boost has been around a long time increasing performance in internal combustion engines, from high altitude fighter planes to setting land speed records in automotive applications. Now, there are several ways to do it. The old school way, like Frankie was talking about, is through a belt driven supercharger, whether it be centrifugal or roots. This roots type supercharger was basically made to increase the air in diesels. In Detroit's back in the day, they would have this because they needed it to make power. And centrifugals, which basically look like a turbocharger, but they are a belt driven turbine that increases pressure by spinning and taking air in and compressing it. Turbos have been around for quite a while as well, all the way back to World War II, used on fighter planes to increase performance at altitude. And the way they work is using the leftover heat and pressure inside the exhaust system to spin a turbine wheel. And that turbine wheel is connected via a shaft to an impeller wheel that sucks in air, forces it down the throat of the engine, and increases pressure in the intake track. Now, turbo technology has progressed a lot and modern turbos have variable geometry vanes inside that can change the range of where the turbo operates to make them more efficient. But in general theory, they all pretty much work the same. Now, obviously there are pros and cons to both systems. So we'll go over superchargers first. The pros are they're easy to hook up. A lot of common kits to get them on engines. You hook a belt to them and they instantly make power. The cons are they can be pretty expensive off the hit. And if you're looking for hood clearance, an old style root spoiler like that is definitely gonna be poking out the hood. The old ones can also be pretty inefficient. The modern ones are pretty good, but they do heat up that intake track even though you're adding more air and that's not great for power. On our other boost producer turbos, they are relatively inexpensive and they already use energy that's being kicked out of the engine to make power, so they're pretty efficient. Yeah, but the cons are that there's a lot of plumbing involved to make that work. You have to run the exhaust up to the turbo, keep it away from everything that can't get hot. You got to run oil lines and intercooler lines and all this kind of stuff. So if you are working in a tight, confined space, probably not the best option and they can be a little bit trickier to install. Now that we are developing boost, we have to find a way to control it so we don't harm the engine. The way these type of superchargers do it is by pulley size or a bypass valve. The pulley size determines how fast the blower spins with the engines. So with a given engine size, the size of the pulley and how fast it spins the blower will determine how much boost it can produce. A bypass valve runs the boost up until it actually develops a pressure enough where it bypasses it so it won't create any more pressure. On engines that you are very worried about blowing up because that's what engines do sometimes, you can have burst panels in the blower itself. So if you have some sort of catastrophic burst in the induction system, it doesn't eject the blower off the vehicle. For turbochargers, boost control is a little more complicated. The main device that controls the amount of boost is the wastegate, and this acts like a bypass valve in the exhaust. There's a line that's plumbed from the boosted side of the induction track to the bottom of the wastegate. And what that does is when the engine gets under boost, boost pushes up on a spring, opens the valve, and allows exhaust gases to flow around the turbo, which decreases the RPM that the turbo is going to spin at, decreasing or leveling off the boost. And the way you control that in a manual style is with springs. You can change the spring inside the wastegate, and that will change the pressure that it needs to see before it opens that valve. You can also add a manual boost T like this one here, 
What this does is restrict the flow to the wastegate so that spring opens at a higher boost pressure. If you want to get even more crazy, you can do it digitally with two solenoid control valves like we did on our Slant 6. And that allows you to apply pressure on the top and bottom of the spring and control precisely when that valve opens at what boost level you want. Now, if you're under boost and you close the throttle blades very quickly, that turbo is still spinning at a very high rate of speed, usually over 100,000 RPM. So it is going to still try and force air in there and it has nowhere to go. So what you have is a blow off valve in the intake track and that acts a lot like a bypass valve. It is referenced off vacuum underneath the throttle blades. When it sees vacuum, it opens up, takes all that boost and lets it out into the atmosphere so that it can't harm your engine. And that is pretty complicated, but once it's all working correct, it works in harmony and gets you exactly the same results. A common question we get asked is how much boost makes how much power? Well, if everything is right, a naturally aspirated engine that has a horsepower number of a given number like say 300, if you put 14.7 PSI to it or one atmosphere, which is actually 100 kPa, that will in fact double. So a 300 horsepower engine at 14.7 would become 600 horsepower. But the caveat, especially with a blower, it takes horsepower to run the blower because they are hooked to a belt that's hooked to the crankshaft. So it takes a little bit of power to run. Plus it does heat up the air a little bit as well. So there's a little bit of loss in there, but as a general rule, you put one atmosphere to it, it will double its power that's naturally aspirated. Okay, so we have the boost. We're controlling the boost. We are making power, but it's all worth nothing if we can't tune it properly. And just so you know, just to get it out of the way, you're always limited by the fuel you're using and the parts you're using. So if the engine you're boosting is in not great condition, you're going to get not great results. And if you're using pump gas or a cheaper fuel, you're going to be limited on how much power you can make. But there's two ways we get fuel in the engine, electronic fuel injection or carburetors. So let's talk about EFI. To add boost to an engine with EFI, it's actually usually pretty simple if the system can handle it. You just have to make sure you have enough fuel pump, you have enough ejector for the power lever you're going to be making, and you have to have a map sensor that can register boost in the engine. Usually stock map sensors are a one bar map sensor or one atmosphere. If you're going to go above that, you need a two, three, four, or five bar map sensor depending on the boost level you're going to be running so that the engine can understand and register how much boost is actually entering and add the appropriate amount of fuel with it. For the fuel system, like I said, you need a fuel pump, but you also need a boost referenced regulator that increases the fuel pressure with the amount of boost, usually in a one-to-one -one ratio, so that the fuel flow into the engine is remaining correct. If we are tuning an engine with electronic fuel injection and adding boost, as a general rule, we will add one point of target air fuel ratio for every atmosphere that we add. So if naturally aspirated, we are running 13.0 for a target air fuel ratio, and we add 14.7 PSI, we will richen it up to 12.0 for our target. And that is on pump gas, and it's pretty safe. We will usually start richer and then work our way up to it, but that keeps us out of trouble most of the time. Boost tuning with old school carburetors is generally the same way, but we're going to be using pounds per hour and looking at the brake specific fuel consumption. Now we can either have a draw through or a blow through type system. So on a carburetor, there's a few things that you have to do. You have to have a boost ready carburetor to do it. You have to change the float so they don't crush under pressure. And you have to look at how much fuel is going through the engine, just like it would be any other way. But you have to tune the fuel for how much power you're making. So on a BSF C range, you will keep it in the range like if it's 0 0.50 for your naturally aspirated, you will increase the amount of fuel at the power level that you're looking for to have the same amount of fuel go through it for that power level. And same thing, you need a boost reference regulator to increase the fuel pressure. It has to have the correct amount of fuel flow for the amount of power it's making. The engine doesn't know anything, but it has to create a bunch of cylinder pressure, so it needs the sufficient fuel to make that power safely. And like EFI, it needs enough fuel through the regulator to make sure it makes enough power. You need a boost referenced fuel regulator. So as the boost increases, the actual fuel flow increases. It has to have sufficient pressure to get fuel into the bowls and the fuel has to get in the engine even with all of that pressure. So basically there's a lot of similarities, whatever kind of boost you run between the two systems. So you just have to have enough fuel for the power you are making. The other side of tuning is timing, and we do need to reduce the timing with the amount of boost because we are increasing the cylinder pressure of the engine. As a general rule, we will pull one degree of timing for every one PSI of boost that we are adding. 
And that is for pump gas. Remember, all these values change if you are using a better fuel. You can get more aggressive with the tune-up if you're running something like race gas or ethanol or methanol. But for pump gas, those usually will keep you out of trouble. This is just a general overview, and we are just scratching the surface on artificial atmosphere, whether it's supercharged or turbocharged. Yeah, we hope this video helped you out for the next time you are going to boost your engine, and make sure that you subscribe to see all of the latest Power Nation videos.